So thank you to everyone for joining the 12th and final Cliff Grads um, session of the 2020 Cliff Grads Science Collaboration Series. Um, it's been a, a really great series of 12 different sessions, both the special student sessions and also the, the thematic, sorry, the special sessions and the thematic student sessions. Uh, so we obviously put this webinar series together in the hope of um, enabling international research collaboration across the CliffGrads network and personally and I know my colleagues at GRA and CCAFS as well have been blown away by how many people have jumped on board and participated in this series. So consistently we've had between 25 and 35 countries attend each and every webinar which has been really great um, and we've had around about 100 participants in each of the special sessions and about 50 participants in each of the student sessions. So that just goes to show, I think, how much um, value this has been to each and every one of you. Um, and I hope that these resources, which are now all online, um, will remain to be of value to you in the future. So today we have a panel of four researchers from the CCAFs and GRA networks. And they'll be talking to us about uh, international research collaboration so you've all actually met them before in other series um, in other sessions within the series. So we've got Hakobo, Sinead, Ningoni and Ole, but I will let Hayden, um, the GRA special representative, introduce them a little bit later on. For now, I will start off with just a little bit of housekeeping. So you've all attended these webinars before, so you do know, I think, I hope by now how to use the question and answer function. So please see that at the bottom of your screen and please record any questions if you have questions for the panelists as we move through. Um, and also the chat box, I see everyone introducing themselves there and noting where they are from and what time it is. Um, please continue to do that. And if you have any side comments to make that aren't a question, please include that there. <coughs> Yeah, so I think I'm going to start off by just doing a little bit of a series recap um, and then we'll have the panelists speak. Let me go from there. So the first session of the special guest speakers that we had was Sir Peter Gluckman, who is the president-elect of the International Science Council um, and chair of the International Government, the International Network of Governmental Science Advice, or INGSA. And he spoke to us a bit about the science policy interface. So I think one of the key takeaways of this session, at least for me, was um, this kind of complex muddle of solutions and problems in that we, and I can speak to this as a policy analyst for the Ministry for Primary Industries for New Zealand, um, we need to consider any piece of, I guess, technical science um, and how that might be perceived in a policy context um, and specifically what other perspectives need to be considered, um, be they social or um, economic or anything else really before any kind of mitigation strategy for us specifically um, can be implemented at the farm level or even, even you know, in a wider sense. So that was really great. And our second speaker in the special sessions was Dr. Olia Glade of the Greenhouse Gas Management Institute. So all of you all as Cliff grads and also our research hosts and supervisors are well aware of the, the concept of a greenhouse gas inventory, but we wanted to sort of go right back to basics with this session and consider what is a national greenhouse gas inventory. So Olia spoke to us uh, a little bit about, you know, understanding the structure behind a national greenhouse gas inventory. And I think one of the key takeaways is how you can present your evidence in a way that can actually be uh, utilized in the national level inventory and being able to identify what data gaps there are at, in your national inventory as well. Our third guest presenter was Dr. Andreas Wilkes um, and he spoke to us about livestock measurement reporting and verification. And he actually used two examples um, of the Kenyan dairy inventory and also the Ethiopian dairy sheep and goat inventory to kind of illustrate how inventories can actually be improved in a national sense. 
And I think most of the cliff grads, your research would relate to livestock systems in some which way. Um, but those of you whose research doesn't, I think you'd still be able to take away from this session or you still hopefully have taken away from this session um, the importance of improving national level inventories and what the implications can actually be for reporting of emissions and also tracking against national um, greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. So the next speaker we had was Dr. John Porter um, and he spoke to us about global agricultural production um, and emission trends and the norms of science. So he actually um, led in by talking to us a little bit about a concept that you're probably familiar with, the Kaya identity, um, but noted that it wasn't quite so relevant for the agriculture sector. And that's because obviously the agriculture sector has different drivers. So um, himself and a colleague, Dr. Pete Smith, who may or may not be on this call, and also one of their PhD students, Dr. Um, well, now Dr. Eskal Bennetson, came up with this alternate equation um, as a better way of representing that. I think this session kind of drove home um, the idea that, you know, it's really complex to communicate science to um, policy and to get um, the most out of the work that you're doing, I think, in agriculture. He used this, um, this phrase, which I've got here on the slide as well, to get more from less and enough from less, which kind of directly refers to improving um, agricultural efficiencies. <clears throat> Sorry, the fifth and final session was um, comprised of the three young farmers, perspectives from three young farmers from South Africa and New Zealand and also from the United Kingdom. Um, and we got to hear from them a little bit about what's going on in the climate change sphere in their own countries um, and also what, what that kind of means for them as farmers. So it's great to see the World Farmers Organization having a program like this. Um, we see, yeah, capacity building for other, from a different sense in terms of global leadership in the sphere, which is really great. So I've included all of the links for the thematic student sessions. I think a few of you have been messaging me asking about the pasture systems and agronomy session. So we do actually have that one um, up online now as of a few hours ago. So that's the first time that that link has been available, hence why I haven't shared it yet. And also the soil system, again, the first time that that link has been available. So it's there. Yeah, so I think without further ado, Hayden, I will hand the floor over to you. Um, so please go ahead. Thanks Hazel and good day, afternoon, morning, evening to everybody. Um, I had the pleasure of chairing one of the um, earlier sessions uh, in which Sir Peter Gluckman participated and then I haven't really been able to participate in the others unfortunately. So I'm really pleased to be able to um, come in for the last one, better late than never. Um, and I'm really happy to have this, this panel with us today. Um, as um, Hazel mentioned, many of, uh, if not all of the panelists are known to you, they've been involved in this, uh, in this series already. So we brought some of the stars back to, uh, to share some of their insights for you. Um, on the panel, we have Dr. Sinead Leahy, who's um, in the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre, uh, who's had a very long and distinguished career in rumen microbiology amongst other things. Um, we have uh, Ole Sander, who's based in the International Rice Research Institute, sitting in Hanoi. Correct. Uh, welcome, Ole. Um, we have Ngone Chirinda with us, who's um, formerly employed now by the Mohammed VI University in Morocco, but I understand still in Colombia, waiting to be, to be moved. So joining us from uh, about four, what are we, what are we now? 4.20 in the morning, so great commitment from Ngone. And also uh, Hakawa Arango, who's working in the International Centre for Tropical Agriculture Research, SIAT, based in Cali, Colombia. Also at uh, about 4.20 in the morning, so thanks thanks to both for joining so early. Um, if we can go to um, the next slide, the way we're going to start this um, is um, we'll have obviously questions and answers from the audience to the panellists. Um, I'll kick it off with, a, with maybe a couple of questions to begin with, but just to just to get going, um, we've asked um, Sinead to present very quickly a couple of uh, examples of international research collaboration, just to kind of, um, just to start the discussions really and give you some really good examples of, of collaborations and then we can we can take it from there. So I'll pass the, the microphone to Sinead to, to um, get started. 
Um, thanks, thanks, Hayden. Um, hi, everyone, um, wherever you are in, in the world. So as Hayden said, Hazel asked me to just um, give um, two slides, really just to talk a little bit about two, I think, are really good examples of a Global Research Alliance uh, research collaboration um, that I know a little bit about. Both our projects were focused on the rumen microbiology area, and they involved many members from the Global Research Alliance Rumen Microbial Genomics um, Network. Um, the first one that I'll talk about is the Global, Re Global Rumen Census. It was published back in 2015 and essentially involved 140 scientists from 73 countries or from 73 organizations in, in 35 um, countries. And essentially what they did, they were looking to ask a question of, you know, in terms of the room and microbial community globally, what does that look like? And this is sort of the first real 16S gene survey that was done at such a global um, scale. And surprisingly or unsurprisingly, depending on where you come from, what they found was that the room and microbial community was quite um, um, common amongst all of the different ruminant species that they looked at and across all of the different geographical locations and the production systems that those ruminants um, uh, were involved in. And from a key point, from a mitigation point of view, when, when this result came out, which was really of interest um, um, to many researchers, is that the rumen methanogens, so those methane-forming microbes that, that produce the enteric methane, uh, were found to be highly conserved across the, the, the world. So, um, meaning that they're pretty much the same in every ruminant um, uh, livestock species that you, you investigate. And that was real interest from a point of view, if you're trying to develop a mitigation solution, particularly targeting those uh, methane forming microbes, then if you um, develop a technology such as an inhibitor or a vaccine, it means that it will have a global um, applicability. So that was a really key message that um, a really important piece of um, um, outcome that came from that particular um, piece of work. If you move on to the second one, Hazel. The second uh, project, which I think was equally as well, a really nice um, collaboration, again, among many members of this um, room and microbial genomics network from the Global um, Research Alliance. And it all stems back to a little workshop that happened back in 2011 when um, the New Zealand government, in support of the GRA, brought together um, around 11 rumen microbiologists from across the, the, the globe. Essentially, they had a really two-day active discussion and they thought about if we really wanted to drive innovation um, and make significant input into the science around rumen microbiology, what, what would we actually need to do? And this group of microbiologists, they came up with this idea of creating a resource of cultures and genome sequences. This is back in the time when if you wanted a genome sequence for a rumen microbe, there was only actually 15 uh, genome sequences available and you know very few cultured uh, rumen microbial microbes available to the rumen microbial community. And so it was thought that it would be a really good idea to create that resource. And so again, we had this um, big uh, international effort led by New Zealand, um, but with involved 60 scientists from 14 organization in nine different um, countries. Um, and essentially we created this resource and it added, and, added 421 cultures um, to the sort of microbial community resource, which is now, now available um, out there. And also there was a number of publications that came through. And one of the highlights was obviously we got it published in Nature Biotechnology, which was a really exciting result for the, the team that was involved. Since the Hungate was published and um, the demand for, for cultures has been you know, significant, 200 cultures provided to 21 different research groups around the world who are all trying to investigate um, and understand room and microbiology for various different um, reasons. Um, I think both projects were really a, a, an amazing example of no one country could have actually put these um, scientific uh, research projects together. It had to be a collaboration from many different scientists across the globe in order to be able to, to get this um, um, type of um, result. Um, and I'll leave it um, there.
Second to help on mute. Thanks, Sinead. That, that's great. Look, they're really, really um, well, high impact, no? high impact examples of collaborations. Um, I'll come back to you um, a bit later, um, yep. and I'll, I'll open up to the to the rest of the panel. Just to, I'll maybe kick off a few questions. I won't um, ask Ngani and Hakoba first because I'll um, allow them to warm up, given that it's so early in the morning. And given that Ole mentioned to us how comfortable he is at 4 p.m. in Hanoi, we'll maybe start with him. Um, Ole, you've, you've been involved in international science a long time. Um, could you maybe share with us um, perhaps some of the highlights um, of collaborations you've been involved in um, of, in, of, any, of any nature? And maybe what were the key characteristics of those collaborations that, that enabled them to be su successful? Sure, yeah, thanks, thanks, Hayden. Hello to, to everybody, wherever you are. Um, international research collaborations, I mean, I, I could, so one, one uh, striking example, just because it was uh, one of the first ones I've been uh, involved, was uh, the samples project organized by CCAFS, uh, the climate change program of the CGAR, and uh, in the earlier days, uh, we, for some reason, just uh, met, um, I think, in Rome with a group of, of, of uh, scientists, climate change scientists, and we thought, okay, um, what we, we thought about gaps that that uh, are lacking, and uh, there are we came up with uh, emission factors and activity data that in in uh, developing countries are not always present, and. Uh, it was really pure coincidence that a, a group of, I don't know, six, seven, eight people sat on one table, had the same ideas, and, and we just wrote down uh, some, some concepts uh, we came up with um, and uh, found someone who, who funded uh, a research project for a couple of years. And that was just, uh, yeah, very interesting because it was it provided the basis uh, to collect <clears throat> very important data across different agricultural systems. Um, and I think, yeah, late part of the, the groundwork for uh, now uh, more advanced research or, or more uh, advanced development in terms of implementation of those, those uh, yeah, options, agri good, good agricultural practices. Um, I was also, the, I have to say, the first project I was involved in in Vietnam was an international uh, research collaboration with the University of Cologne in Germany. Um, and it was just very interesting because it was, <clears throat> I was a bit the, the, the odd one out. Uh, it was, uh, it focused on, on very different um, disciplines, uh, including, um, yeah, it was more on, on ecology, um, water, uh, hydrology modeling uh, and I had a component on greenhouse gas emissions uh, which was very interesting to see how uh, yeah different disciplines disciplines approach uh, similar questions and the project had uh, yeah a lot of um, capacity building involved which was it's yeah it, it's uh, I, I like that a lot and it was very uh, very interesting to work uh, on research, but also then on, on translating this research uh, to uh, the local context. Thanks, Ali. So in your example, you had a important, uh, some perhaps serendipitous meeting uh, in Rome. I actually might have been at that meeting. I vaguely remember something like that. Oh. And um, and Sinead mentioned also a meeting back in back in the day um, that had you know ten or eleven scientists, and then a good idea came about. And I think. Um, you mentioned that someone funded it, and presumably, well, obviously, with Sinead's project, someone funded it. So, um, you know, a, a chance meeting, a good idea, and, and a bit of funds to get things rolling were, were obviously important. Um, let's go alphabetically. Hakobo, any any um, maybe highlights of in your career of sort of really standout projects and what made those successful from your perspective? What were the key factors that enabled them to happen? Yes, uh, thank you, Hayden. And Hello to everyone. Yeah, I think one of the key uh, elements of the uh, in, uh, collaboration projects that I have been involved is uh, mostly the complementarity. So I think is is uh, 
difficult to to have a, a successful collaboration if you are if a, everyone is doing the same i think that that's the beauty of the collaboration i think the complementarity and i think we all come from different approaches uh, of course with our common interest but uh, but uh, it's important to have some complementarity uh, so uh, one example for ex is, is the research we do on biological nitrification inhibition. Uh, this is a phenomenon that uh, certain plants uh, possess to release some chemical exudates and to uh, slow the pace of uh, nitrification in, in soil. And it has, we have shown the potential to reduce nitrous oxide emissions from soil. So that's uh, one example that uh, we have a collaboration with people in, in Japan, for example. So if you if you think from from outside what what uh, uh, Japan and Colombia have in common in agricultural research, I mean they are in very opposite sides of the world. They uh, have very very different production systems, but at the end, I think there are some complementarities and also common interest that is to 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 improve the nitrogen use efficiency of crops in in our case for example of pasture and also to be able to reduce nitrous oxide emissions and nitrogen pollution in general so probably these are uh, two or three key elements that uh, i would like to 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 suggest for for the panel Thanks, Jacobo. Tengon, uh, any, anything to add that you would disagree with or maybe reinforce? If you're still there. He seems to have disappeared. Yeah, okay, we'll come, come back to him if he joins us. Um, so we've heard, we've heard about resources, we've heard about a good, a good idea and a, and a chance meeting perhaps. Um, with, we know that, um, well, complementarity and common interest. Um, Sinead, on the examples you gave, uh, gave um, I mean, funding was important to have, you know, the activity happen, but you had a lot of participants. Yeah. Uh, and everyone's busy and everyone's doing, you know, lots of different things at once. Why do you think you were able to attract so many participants? I think, you know, from the two, the sort of two, two projects that I've been involved in, it first came down to the, the generation of the idea and, you know, the idea we identified was, you know, there was a real need in the community for, for, for the projects that we delivered um, to. And then alongside that, you know, we had people who, you know, were, you know, the cheerleaders, the people who, you know, supported the project, you know, when we tried to go for funding, you know, supported the projects, you know, when we went to, you know, one of the Hongate, we went to the community sequencing program in the Joint Genome Institute in the United States, which helped us significantly. And again, we had cheerleaders that were supporting us on that. But alongside that as well, we then had the drivers. So the people who were involved, who were the people that, you know, because a lot of these big projects, you know, have um, huge roller, co it's a roller coaster, lots of highs, lots of lows, you know, things go horribly wrong, things go horribly right. And so you, you need to have these people on your team who are really passionate about what they're doing, but also because they're the people who will drive you through and drag the project to, to, to the conclusion, because, you know, you can see, for instance, the Hungate, it started in 2011, you know, the big paper that was published was, you know, in 2018, you know, that's seven years of a lot of work and seven years of, of, of people, you know, trying to bring all of those 60 scientists along on board and acknowledging that those, some of those scientists were doing work, you know, they weren't funded, they were doing it in kind, you know, because they were also passionate about the project. And then that goes back to, you know, identifying a need that people see the need for why we need to do this type of work. And it's going to benefit not just, you know, the people who are doing the work, but also benefit them in the long term um, as well. So, yeah, a few things in there, I think, Hayden, but, you know, mm -hmm. certainly, you know, a good team and being able to ride that roller coaster of, of, of great highs and, and terrible lows. Um, <laughs> and, and you get there in the end, yeah. Although you seem to want to jump in there, yeah. Quickly, quickly add, yeah. So because uh, funding, of course, is important, but uh, I have also made the experience that 
um, sometimes if you have an idea and if you are passionate about it, uh, it's um, and you have a, a team <clears throat> who is interested in it, you can you can do a little bit of, of research and, uh, uh, and and develop an initial step. And from and once you have that. Um, you can uh, start applying also for for funding, uh, and I've made this experiment uh, this experience, uh, for example, with uh, some of the uh, the GIS work that I've recently been working on, which has started with no funding at all, and and uh, me and the GIS scientists were just very interested to see what can we do with with GIS data in terms of uh, mitigation technology for rice. And uh, it has developed into, yeah, quite uh, substantial research activities in many countries now. Yeah, I think I've, I've seen that. I mean, I haven't, I'm not a, an active scientist, but I'm, you know, around scientists pretty much all the time. And um, I've seen that happen a lot where people who are passionate just get on and start something. And then all of a sudden there's an avalanche, uh, snowball rather, effect, sometimes avalanches too. Um, Angona, you're back with us. Um, I was going to throw the floor to you and, and just ask you whether you had any um, any things to maybe any different opinion or anything to reinforce from what you heard from uh, from Ole Hakobo and, and Sinead about you know in your career the sort of key scientific collaborations you've been involved in or, or, or aware of and what what made those successful. Yeah, I think I've got uh, like two examples. Uh, one of them which just uh, emerged organically, which was really around the kids. Uh, the earlier days of uh, the, the click network. And uh, it was after we had students that received grants, just like the, the flip grad students. And uh, we then wanted to synthesize the, some something. We wanted to come up with something in terms of uh, uh, after the students had done research. And then it really was difficult to find something that was, uh, that could come together. I mean, because the students were getting grants for, for different things, just as uh, in the current place that uh, network. And, uh, and then later we managed to we identify the project in Zimbabwe, in Kenya, and in India, which were almost similar. So we tried to then bring that together into a synthesis. And um, the challenge that we faced there was actually coming to bringing this work together and also the communication and, uh, and uh, across culture collaboration. So in the end, uh, I think the student from, from India dropped out late in the process. And then we ended up writing a paper for Zimbabwe and Kenya. So it was something that we tried to, to collaborate on that paper, but it was, it was difficult to, to get something out of it. But in the end, it was good that we actually did get out of it. And then we get something out of it. And then the other thing was um, the work that we did with Yakobo on the LAMNET network, so the Latin American Mitigation Network. So there we brought a couple of students to, to Cali, and uh, uh, we also brought in a couple of uh, people to help in the uh, research and uh, to, to help in the course. And after the course, the students went back to their respective country, and then they had to do an experiment where we looked at greenhouse gas emissions from a degraded and in, and an undegraded pasture. And uh, they sent their samples to CIAT in uh, Colombia for analysis. And then we wrote the paper together. So it was really birthed from this course that we then decided to then write a paper out of it. So it has most of the, some of these scientific collaborations are more organic. It was not really planned, just as all in um, I mentioned. And, uh, but sometimes good things come out of them. Sometimes uh, you just learn lessons. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions in the uh, in the panel now uh, for, for the panel now from the audience. So I'll um, I'll get straight into those, and then we'll come back if if we have. Uh, a lack of enthusiasm from the audience. Um, the one that's ranked highest, we'll take that first. Um, and it's about the coordination of international projects and how that works and, and practice. And maybe anyone want to have a, have a crack at that? I mean, Sinead's talked about the, the crushing lows and the euphoric highs. Um, is there any sort of practical advice you could give around the, the actual coordination of these things? Yeah, so, so I think in New Zealand, we have this expression called herding cats, 
I don't know if that's something that other people are familiar with, but it's essentially, yes, coordination, um, particularly of scientists can be um, challenging, particularly because, you know, scientists are often really, really busy um, and they've got their own research to do. And if you're trying to coordinate a project where you need to get something for them, you have to take, um, you know, a very, I would call it a persistent approach, but obviously you've got to strike that balance of um, being, you know, ver- you know, um, also bossy, but nice as we like to call it. And it's about, you know, knowing who your team members are and who are the best person on the team to be involved in sort of the coordination. It's also about, you know, you've got to be pretty organized um, and obviously be very focused on your end end goal, where you want to go and and how you need to to get there. So, you know, persistence and being organized is probably um, um, two things I would say from a coordination of international project projects, but also you need to have fun and enjoy working with the the people as well. Yeah. Thanks, Sinead. Jacobo, you know about herding cats. We've just seen your, your colleague there in the background. <laughs> Any, anything you'd add? Uh, yes, well, I think uh, I, I, I also wanted to mention a very critical point that uh, Ngoni uh, shared with us, uh, and it's uh, the, the importance of students in the international collaboration. So many collaborations started just with, with sharing a student. So at the beginning, maybe you don't know where you are going, but at least you are sending a student to, to a colleague. And, 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 and things start for, from a good student. At, at, and and uh, so, so I think that's an important, a very important or key element in international collaboration. So going a little bit back of what we were discussing. Uh, so, so probably I know that Cliff uh, grad students are, are very good examples of that because normally they are attached to an institution or to a, a laboratory or in, in a given country, but uh, the grad student, uh, um, the GRA uh, Cliff uh, program allows this opportunity from one student. And I think this is a very a critical moment in your career where you can go to a different place and create these bounds or these uh, lines of connections between very different or very distant uh, uh, laboratories. Uh, in terms, uh, so, so that's one point that then Goni uh, brought to my mind. So I just wanted to highlight that, especially because we are talking now with uh, many international students we, are, we were, uh, or we, who are uh, being part of this, uh, of this uh, uh, Cleve Grad uh, initiative. In terms of, uh, of um, coordination, I think as, as uh, Sinead was saying, so there are uh, ups and downs. I think uh, uh, important is to have uh, uh, meetings, regular meetings, hopefully at least once a year or so, uh, face-to-face meetings, because sometimes uh, I know with these COVID uh, times, so of course, that's, that's, that's difficult to do, but uh, there are many face-to-face meetings that solve one problem that you cannot solve with hundreds of emails. Uh, so I think that, that that's uh, something maybe important to, to take into account when you are coordinating international projects. Okay. Thanks, Jacobo. We have a few more questions coming through. Um, there's uh, yeah okay the one that's now ranked top um, <clears throat> it was it was on my mind too this 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 whole thing and particularly the COVID situation and you know Sinead mentioned there was a small meeting of ten or eleven people some years ago Ollie mentioned he was in Rome and a meeting in one of the tables had a discussion and then this idea came um, <clears throat> you know when we can't meet each other in person and we're not having these opportunistic moments in the margins of a conference or something how can we get the wheels moving as this question from Valencia has been put out you know like I guess the Cliff Grad seminars and, and sessions were intended to hope hope to create some opportunities for that to occur. Um, it's obviously difficult on Zoom, as we know, all know, to try and have a, a conversation with everyone, but we tried to create some space for that. Do you have any thoughts, uh, anyone who wishes to go first, maybe start with Ngoni and then Ole, of, um, you know, in, in the COVID world, limited resources, not being able to see each other in person, how, how can we just get started? I mean, you've touched on this already, I think. Um, I think the students' uh, that dimension is key, as, as Jacob has mentioned can be the glue between the institutions, but anything else you'd add? Yeah, I think I think uh, I saw one of the slides and one of the presenters talked about how 
solutions and problems emerge together. And I thought that was really uh, genius of uh, expressions. And I mean, we're all kind of like learning to, to, to live in this, in this new and emerging world. And um, we're still, in some cases, there are some who are slow and some people are fast in, in it. And uh, we've also had some people where before, even before the COVID crisis, there was a lot of uh, online meetings and also what the Click Club has done, I think is also a, a move uh, towards that. So in terms of uh, how that would work in the collaboration, in, in most cases, I mean, like uh, some things that start in, in, the, in the old world now, things started with sometimes through face-to-face -face meetings, but you also had sometimes when you things started through just an email and you knew somebody who knew somebody, and then you started through the, an uh, email and then you had these large emails where everybody was copied and uh, things just grew like that. And uh, now we, in the new world, we have to maybe meet through a Zoom, uh, we have to learn new skills. And I guess we need, I think it's, it's good that we are doing this, I mean, talking about, about this in a Zoom meeting and uh, which means probably we are we have uh, we are learning fast, and I guess the collaboration in, in terms of collaboration, we probably have to, to also move in that direction. So I, I think it's an it's an emerging world, and I think we are we are still learning uh, how to to live this to have the same habits or to have the same uh, to do the same things that we were doing before, but now more virtually. So that would be my only any. Any reflections? <laughs> I also unfortunately don't have uh, the the magic recipe here to solve that. Um, it's it's difficult, but uh, I I agree with Ngoni. Um, online meetings uh, are essential. Um, uh, meet people, write emails. Um, sometimes <clears throat> things grow. Sometimes they don't. Um, I don't think. Uh, yeah. I mean, there will be lots of downs, especially uh, in, the, in the COVID struck world. So my recommendation would probably not to give up. Um, also, as a start, at least, I mean, can it can be explored then that there is some desk study first, start with a literature mm -hmm. review, um, any secondary data sets that that might exist and might exist and then have not been analyzed and explored so those kind of initial steps at least can can uh, get things going very good very good suggestions thanks um any other questions come through let me check I could probably um, add to that, Hayden, as well, sure. actually. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, to the projects we've been involved in and, and that, you know, there's the Rumen Microbial Genomics Network, which is part of the Global Research Alliance. And the Global Research Alliance does have a variety of other networks as well. And I'm sure Hazel could put a list up. You know, there's the Manure Management Network, the Animal Health Network, um, the Animal Nutrition Network. Um, and particularly, I, I know a little bit more about the Rumen Microbial Genomics Network one, but we also often have early career scientists or students take the initiative, for example, to uh, look after the Twitter accounts to organize the newsletters, which means that they start engaging with the Rumen Microbial community. And I'm not sure what the other networks do, but it's, um, you know, offering your services to do little things like that often gets you to start to know the people in the area um get more familiar you know we often share a lot of um you know opportunities through those networks like for phd studentships you know jobs in certain areas you know re really interesting things it doesn't cost anything to join i think the information for the the networks is on the global research alliance um some of the networks are more active than others um but you know that's something worth considering um as well just to get on that email list and you sort of see what's happening in your your area and i'm sure there are other networks out there that might do something similar just wanted to add that hayden that's great so no, it's a really good suggestion and there are other networks out there and i'm i'm, I'm privy to some and part of some of them as well in latin america and florentia is also involved as well and, and they're starting to develop some momentum um, which is great um, I think any and all interaction is, is useful in this in this climate we're in, right? To try and 
sort of seed ideas. Um, there's, a, there's a scientific question around sort of, I guess, the method research approach. Um, it was uh, picked up based on Sinead's presentation uh, around the scientific collaborations um, are applying a similar approach, but in very different contexts. Um, um, Sinead may want to touch on this in, in a while, or maybe pass the floor to Jacobo if you have any, any reflections on that one. Um, how do you overcome the challenge of applying a similar approach in quite different, in quite different contexts? You mentioned Japan, Colombia as two collaborators. Any other, any other insights you might provide? Jacobo? Yep. Uh, well, let me think. Mm. Yeah, probably there, there was a project that we had with uh, the University of Hohenheim in, in Germany, and it was more or less on the same uh, uh, line uh, we were talking before. Uh, that, for of course, uh, when you have these partners in in uh, in these uh, very specialized research organizations that are located probably in Europe, New Zealand, or the U.S., uh, of course. Uh, Sometimes there are different interests. You have a, a common interest that's, of course, understanding a mechanism that, but the outcome of that it's different. For for example, in this case, for the University of Hohenheim, was more on the discovery and to find uh, new evidence of a new biochemical uh, uh, model that uh, that uh, we were describing. But for us, actually. Of course, we wanted to understand what's happening, but what we actually wanted was to to uh, to create a solutions for for real farmers that were here in Colombia or in in other parts of of, of uh, tropical countries. So you know, there there sometimes you find this um, uh, not I w I wouldn't call it conflicts, but uh, but different approaches that, for example, some some partners are more interested in basic science and some others are more interested on development. So, but I think that the a real collaboration is to find these complementarities and hopefully with this uh, basic science, you are able to drive uh, a concrete uh, a development solutions uh, in international collaboration. Thanks, Echo. Any other very quick reactions to that um, from anyone? Well, I mean, it, it probably also always depends <clears throat> what is, what's the, the challenge and what's the problem. So sometimes uh, it's, it's very basic where just uh, some materials are not available uh, in, in one country that are available in the other country. Uh, and sometimes you can be creative and flexible and, and improvise a bit and, and, and solve the issue. And in other, uh, at other times, it's that's just not possible. And and uh, if you if you try, you you might sacrifice uh, the validity of of your research. So it, it really depends on on what the um, what the problem is. But I think generally, um, <clears throat> remain creative uh, and open and flexible, and then um, try to identify solutions. There's another question. Um, uh, Ngoni, did you want to say something? No, I just wanted to say that, I mean, just to add to what Jacobo and Ole have said, I mean, the, one of the things that is uh, happening in the greenhouse gas world is, is trying to move towards a bit of commonality. And I think the Global Research Alliance has also been trying to push that in terms of standardization of methodologies across, across the different regions. And, uh, in some cases, as, as Jacobo pointed out, sometimes the, the objectives are, are different. And uh, also, as, uh, as Ole pointed out, sometimes the infrastructure is, is different. And uh, there is, but I think there is, there is a move in the global, in the uh, greenhouse gas world to, to, to have a co common method across, uh, across the region. And as I think Ole talked about the samples project, that was one of the the objectives of the samples project to have some commonality across the, the region and maybe have some standards. So in some cases it's difficult to, to all get to the same level, but I think there is there's an effort to move in that direction. And I think the global research has been has been trying to help people go in that direction. And I think also uh, Hayden, if I can jump in is is uh, 
the the nature of the work that we are doing that is uh, on climate change so i think uh, uh, and this is a global problem so whatever bit of information that for example ole can do in vietnam it's also helping uh, people here in colombia even though they don't know ole they don't know the rice system that he works but but I think this is this is uh, something we need to take into account that we are all working in a global problem, and whatever piece of information or whatever uh, evidence or whatever technology we can find in New Zealand, in Vietnam, in in Africa, in South America is helping uh, other people or, or or everyone in in the, in remote places. A really good point. I was going to ask a, a question, a devil's advocate question, and say, do we even need to collaborate internationally? Um, and I think you answered, you've answered that question for me. Um, there's a question here around funding sources. Could could we mention some international funding sources that we could access in the future? I think that's a very long list. That's probably not um, the best place to do it here. But what I would say is, you know, if people on this call are aware of opportunities, please pass those to the Secretariat. We can make, use the GRA website. We use Twitter. We make those visible. Um, we have a number of opportunities advertised there um, uh, regularly. Um, and I, I guess I would also make the point that it's not always international funding sources. It's, it's often national budgets that are joined together. And we have this term of the so-called virtual common pot, which is sort of pooling resources, but spending them nationally and having and national teams working together in a collaboration. That's, that's difficult to pull together, but it's, it's usually the way it works. Um, there aren't many op examples of truly international science funds. It's often a you know an aggregation of, of national budgets, um, um, and to do that, of course, you need someone or some some people to be champions and make that happen. But but um, you know let's let's just as a community um, share everything we have we have with everyone we we know, and and, and um, hopefully people will be able to find the resources they need. Any other? Um, I think we're getting to the, towards the end of the this session anyway. But any other questions from the audience? Um, there's um, perhaps. Um, Perhaps I'll just ask, um, what would be sort of, like Sinead, you touched on the, 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 the really difficult moments in some of these things. What are the, what in your view and others too, are the sort of most significant challenges in pulling this, pulling this off and, and having successful research activities? Particularly, and think about that, think about that not only in the past, but also in this new, in this new context. You know, is it the time zone? Has it been awake at four in the morning when everyone else is comfortable at four p.m.? Is it kind of everyone's too busy? Is it? I uh, just uh, hi, you know, just uh, I just wanted to ask uh, to go back to what you were explaining in terms of funding and uh, national funding. I think one of the key things that we need to to do as scientists and as uh, as researchers is to make sure that the public gets to know about what we are finding, right? And I I think. The, especially for national funding, it needs to be something that, I mean, policymakers listen to people. Right? They, they basically look at the sentiment in which direction people are going. And uh, we have the opportunity to, to make sure that our results or our findings are accessible to the public in such a way that they could then influence the way the local funds are, are channeled. So I think the onus is also on us in terms of fundraising and in terms of how we communicate our science to the general public, which would then influence polit politicians' decision making, because politics politicians just like to be liked, right? I mean, the nature of, of their design, right? So we need to make sure that the the our science is top on the minds of a lot of people who would then influence um, uh, uh, decision making. So I think in terms of fundraising, it, it is also on us to to make sure that the science that we are doing becomes accessible and digestible to the local public. That's a good point. And um, I'm reminded by the Sir Peter Gluckman webinar when there's quite a lot of questions and, and he said to this, the Cliff Grad students, you know, just find that junior policy analyst somewhere and go and take them out for a coffee and, and or something and maybe have a Zoom call, whatever it is now, um, and just, you know, get to know them because the chances are they're kind of in the same position. They're new in their career, trying to find their way, um, but the difference is they're in that ministry and they will be talking to other people and you know through that through that relationship and he, he emphasized that a lot the, the relationships really matter and that trust really matters 
um, and developing and sort of nurturing those relationships will be will be really important to help you and your career as scientists um, and that will apply also to funding opportunities as you've just said <clears throat> maybe um i think we're getting pretty close to the end so maybe um i'll just open up Sinead, anyone else uh, ole Jacobo, uh, wish to maybe just add, add a final thought um, and maybe if, if you have any any um reflections on the, on the key challenges to bring those in or, or anything you wish to you wish to um to say just before we pass back to hazel to to continue first Hello. well probably Hayden just uh, to give uh, a recognition also to the students that are uh, here with us I think the the Cliff Grads program is a great program but uh, actually the the all all come back to the students I think if you are able to have a good student a motivated student that is uh, always curious and always uh, eager to 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 do good research and to and to uh, make a career in science, I think that's the the key to success in, in a project. Uh, even though limitations in funding or or whatever other type of limitations, if if there is a good students, I think you will always find a way to 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 find to to do good research. So. So yeah, I think maybe just uh, this is a final thought and a final recognition to to all the students that uh, are attached to the programs and probably uh, also uh, some of them that were not selected in in the in the in the round that they apply for. I think to to do not be discouraged and to and to keep trying. That uh, uh, luckily I think the program will continue and if 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 not this program probably another option will come. But uh, yeah, to continue high in motivation. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah. Oh, Anna. Anna. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go, go. Okay. Um, I think that always remember that science is fun. That's the reason that we got into it, and that's why a lot of us actually um, um, do it. But also, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever heard this rate, you know, this comment, but 90% in science is failure and that's just normal and I think it goes back to Jacobi when he says you know don't get this you know don't get uh, disencouraged by the fact when you when you fail it happens a lot in scientists and some of the best scientists I know you know have failed many times at the applications that they've gone to and that's where that persistent gene comes in you know keep going back um you know and eventually you know it, it will happen um, for you. And if it isn't happening, then get creative, as Oli mentioned yesterday, think around the problem um, and just, um, um, yeah, just, just keep going and, and don't, don't give up. It does, does come to fruition at some stage if you stay enthusiastic and stay at it. Yeah. Thanks, Sinead. I think you're right. And I think um, <clears throat> if, if policymakers were honest, they'd, they'd also admit that 90% of policies fail, but they, they don't often admit that. Uh, Oli, do you want to make a comment? Yeah, just maybe going uh, one step back to the to the challenges. Um, I think one challenge uh, that uh, yeah happens in collaborative projects is that not always all people can commit time at the same time. So <clears throat> you send an email, you uh, ask for to do something. The other person doesn't have the time right now. Maybe even doesn't reply. Um, then the email gets lost, the person forgets to reply. Um, just don't give up, be persistent, try again. <clears throat> that's really, uh, that's what, what I have realized in the, uh, in the recent years to find time uh, and time when also the other person needs that time is very difficult. So the coordination uh, is, is key there and it's it's really not easy. So my my uh, yeah suggestion is uh, don't give up and and try again. Be persistent, as Sinead said. Yeah, I think I've just I mean over the years I've come to the realization that the future doesn't come, the future is created actually. And it's those interactions, the way you interact with people, the way you collaborate and and. Uh, fail sometimes, like Shanet said, and uh, win sometimes, that's how you are creating the future. So in reality, 
uh, it's the, the future is already in the making and uh, and we we make it as we go along and it is those interactions that help us shape what the future becomes so some failures there sometimes you win sometimes you learn and uh, the most important thing is that you are going forward Thanks, Ngwane. I, I endorse that 100%. And, um, you know, resources are always necessary, ultimately, but um, I would say it's not the key to success. It's actually having the, the passion, the champions to actually just make it happen and find a way against all odds. Um, and I've seen that many, many times, and including in the examples we've heard today. It's about the people and, yeah, just determination to just, yeah, follow their, follow their passion. Um, so look, I think um, that, that brings it close to this particular section and um, I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us, um, you know, some um, holy hours of the morning for some of them. Um, but, you know, I think for the students that, that demonstrates that, you know, while they're, let's say, advanced in their careers, and I wouldn't say they're old, um, they're also still passionate about, um, about this topic and they're prepared to, you know, put in their time for you and, and provide their insights for you. So I'd like to really thank them for that. We really do appreciate it. And we, we look forward to ongoing collaboration through the through the Cliff Grades program. And um, yeah, thanks for your participation in the audience. You were a bit quieter today than previous sessions, but I think from the chat box, we've seen a lot of people really, uh, very happy with, um, with the discussion we've had. So um, thanks very much. Hazel. Yeah, so thanks so much, Hayden. And thanks again to all of our panelists. Really, really appreciate you sharing your experience with the Cliff Crads, and I know that they do as well. So just a final couple of comments from me. Um, and actually, Sinead, you already kind of touched on this a little bit. I think most of this has already come up. Um, just re regarding how you can all stay involved with the Cliff Grads program. Obviously, we have the buddy system, which you're all familiar with, where we peer um, an alumni who either has already completed their research visit or nearly um, completed their research visit with one of the newer alumni just to share kind of, you know, how you culturally transitioned and some academic differences you encountered, etc. So it'd be great to have everyone um, eventually being a buddy for a future Cliff Grads uh, student. So just bear that in mind. Um, and then obviously the WhatsApp group. So we share opportunities and events. If you uh, find something that you think should be shared, please feel free to email it through to us at the cliffgrads at globalresearchalliance.org email address. Um, Sinead, you already commented on all of the networks on the GRA website. And yeah, please do email either the cliffgrads email address or the secretariat at Global Research Alliance email address as well. Um, yeah, and just some acknowledgements from me, I just want to note uh, how much running goes into this program and yeah, especially from Hayden and Linny of CCAFs, they obviously provide, they, they're, the, they're the ones who are connected with the right people to ensure that this program can continue to be run. Um, so that's very crucial um, for CCAFs, Zanero and Sadie, who have put a lot of work into the the Cliff Grads program in general, but also specifically this webinar session, and then to my colleagues at the GRA Secretariat, so Rebecca um, Deb, who facilitated the World Farmers Organization um, session, and everyone else in the GRA Secretariat as well, and all of our guests, special guest speakers who I mentioned, and obviously all of our panelists from today, and Todd, um, who wasn't able to make it as well, special mention to him. And yeah, all of the Cliff grads just for coming to these sessions and collaborating. It was like Olia said in her session, she's just blown away by the intelligence of you all, um, which we obviously know because we um, were on the selection panels for you. So we know how intelligent you are, but it's just really great to see you working together and asking um, excellent questions and just really thinking about things outside of the norms, which is great. Um, so to the round three students for actually being willing to share their PhD research, that was um, yeah something quite unique and, and special. It's the first time we've done it like that and I think it went really well. Um, and to all of the hosts for even making Cliff Grads experiences possible. So yeah, thanks to everyone. It was really, really great. So with that said, I believe Sanira has left the call, but he did... Um, ask me to thank everyone as well on behalf. Sanero's there. Sanero's there, Hazel. Yeah. Cool. Go. I'll oh, just unmute you, Sanero, if you have something. Oh, good. Say. Thanks. How do we yeah. go? Cool. I'm going to stick for a few more minutes. Yeah, I would like to, um, on behalf of CCAPS, uh, thanks uh, everyone who uh, 
were able to, to join the, the 2020 Cliff Grads webinar. It was great. And let you all know that CKFs is at your disposal should you uh, have any uh, questions. Just let us know. Uh, thanks all. Thanks, Aniro. Yeah, so to thank, thanks to everyone else here. Are all the links um, as per in other sessions and we will email out the recording of this session and also the, um, the slides from the session which have each of the YouTube links. So yeah, thanks once again, everyone. And please have a wonderful morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you might be. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>